I kind of continue and uh, actually finish up our discussion of plasticity. Um, so going back again to our uh, stress strain curve, we've now looked at our last regime, our plastic regime, and we're going to finish up today. So we've finished regime one, elasticity, continuum elasticity, linear elasticity, anisotropic elasticity, isotropic elasticity, um, viscoelasticity. We've kind of covered them all. Uh, we've now talked about regime two, which is your plastic deformation. We talked about strengthening mechanisms. Um, when do we know when a material is going to yield and not yield? In the last regime, we also kind of discussed uh, rotation uh, as well. So we're finishing up plastic with this last kind of topic here, which is going to be time temperature dependent plasticity, which is uh, specifically we're going to talk about creep today. Um, and then finally, we'll get into regime three in the next couple of videos, which is fracture. And that's it for mechanics. So let's talk first about our last kind of plastic mechanism. Uh, again, there's much more if you take uh, another course in uh, specifically designed for mechanics. But today we're going to talk about um, a really insidious type of failure mechanism, which is creep. So, and this is time temperature dependent plastic uh, time temperature dependent <laughs> plastic deformation in crystalline materials. So, if you remember back to our discussion of linear visco, oops, here, to linear viscoelastic material, so LVE, we talked about a creep test where we kept our stress constant. So, when our stress is kept constant for a particular mechanical test, and we measure uh, basically, how will the strain respond um, for a certain, you know, as a function of time for a certain constant stress? We call this a creep test. So, creep is really important, um, and it, it's a really insidious type of mechanism. And I say insidious because uh, at high temperatures, especially at high temperatures, at high temperatures or at high stresses, or and at high stress values. Um, you'll find that actually the stress where, um, when you're running a creep test, the stress where creep or fatigue ensues is much less than the reported or measured yield stress of the material. So basically, you can, you know, purchase or, you know, you design or you use kind of your mechanics and material knowledge to select what material can possibly work for a given application. But if you're working at high temperatures or long times and high stresses, you might find that your material will fail um, uh, sooner than you expect, even uh, depending on your ranking. So this is beyond ranking Tresca and von Mises. So whatever the yield stress or the kind of the failure or the yielding uh, kind of mechanism you predict from these criteria, and that's we covered in a previous video, creep will happen uh, at stresses much lower. So your actual, so actual will be much less than your predicted. So this is an issue, right? Because you pick a material you think it's going to survive due to this prediction based on these criteria, and what you find out is it actually fails much sooner. So that is bad. You know, think about aerospace applications. You know, uh, airplanes. We don't want those materials to fail because uh, it could cause you know catastrophic failure and loss of life. So we need to understand uh, about creep when it can occur and how we could again tune our materials to know uh, and uh, avoid that from happening. So. There are basically three regimes of creep regime. So primary, secondary, or tertiary, uh, primary, secondary, and runaway creep, or tertiary creep. So let's look at that in the video right here. So this is basically a plot of, again, your strain as a function of time. So in the first regime, primary creep, uh, you notice that there's some a certain amount of time where basically we can't even measure. There's basically no strain in your material. So here, there's no kind of creep mechanism occurring here. But at some point, time t equals t naught, we start to measure uh, some amount of creep. Uh, basically, this is you kind of think of this as strain, creep strain. In the second regime, we actually are going to have um, uh, some equations to kind of see, and we could, uh, we'll talk about uh, essentially this regime a lot. Uh, but you start to see kind of this almost kind of constant slope. So creep uh, is kind of actually a little bit well characterized here, depending on the mechanism we're going to talk about. Um, deformation mechanism maps in just a second. Mechanism maps. So we are going to kind of measure what is the creep, uh, the creep strain here, and we'll kind of talk about what parameters can kind of change this. But um, you'll see that the creep continues to grow, 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 grow. And once you hit this regime three, uh, this tertiary or runaway creep, your creep starts to grow exponentially. Um, you probably heard that a lot, unfortunately, with this uh, COVID uh, virus happening. But anyways, um, you'll notice that the creep 
will exponentially increase. So now, at this point in Regime 3, it's, you're done. You can't stop this creep. Your material is going to fail, and it's going to fail extremely, extremely quickly. So um, once you get into Regime 3, it's runaway creep. You can't stop it at that point, so you can't control it. So uh, we want to kind of figure out, and we're going to study a lot about Regime 2 and what parameters can uh, control and adjust uh, or control our creep. So let's go on to the next page right here. Excuse me for having it set up correctly. So creep, uh, and specifically our strain rate uh, of creep, oops, touch my screen, uh, is going to follow this generic equation. Uh, generic, but it's going to be, um, we're going to see kind of some specific parameters switch uh, depending on uh, what type of creep mechanism or regime that we're uh, dealing with. So our strain rate, because you see that dot, that's a time. So our change in strain as a function of time that's just essentially what this is act, uh, for creep, is given by this Kc um, sigma to the x power, dg, our grain size, to the y power, and the diffusion mechanism of creep. So um, this is kind of the better expression that we're going to use a lot. So we are eventually going to look at a table where how, how does x, y, and uh, this c value, how does it change depending on the creep mechanism that we're dealing with? So AC, as you can see here, is just an empirical material. It's a constant. So you don't have to worry too much about K sub C. But again, it will change depending on the mechanism. But we, again, in material science, we're not interested in 10%, 20%, 30% improvements. We're looking at order of magnitude changes. And especially since a lot of these parameters are scaling um, to a power law or an exponential scaling, we're really not going to care too much about this guy. So, but again, mathematical calculations, you need that. You'll fit that parameter. Now, sigma is our applied stress. So Remember, our creep experiment is a constant stress. Sigma equals sigma naught. Um, X is going to be that power law scaling. DG is just like we talked about in the hall patch. That is our grain size. So we know that to increase the yield strength of our material, we know that our change in sigma Y is proportional inversely to GG. As DG increases or decreases, our uh, yield stress increases dramatically. If we increase our yield strength or our grain size, we decrease our yield strength. And remember, this holds up until about a value of 10 nanometers. And we know that from our last video. So, and finally, the diffusion. We know uh, D equals D naught exponential minus QA over QT. We, that should be kind of a grain in your head after lecture four. <laughs> and actually, we've done it uh, quite a few times. Um, but the activation energy is going to change, again, depending on QC is just your activation energy. It will change depending on the creep mechanism utilized here. So let's look at one of our first, uh, and specifically, um, it's the diffusion of vacancies either through the bulk lattice or along grain boundaries, uh, and diffusion of vacancies to dislocation. But again, uh, we'll get to that in just a second. So our first uh, creep mechanism is this Nabarro herring or lattice volume or bulk diffusion. So Nabarro herring creep, also um, basically you can see it, uh, Nabarro herring, we're going to kind of denote it as NH. NH creep is basically dealing with uh, essentially the diffusion of vacancies or diffusion, you know, the diffusion of dislocations, um, the motion of dislocations, essentially your creep, like how your material moves throughout the bulk. So we're talking about lattice bulk of volume diffusion. So if we want to kind of look at that schematically, let's say I have a material here. So my material, I'm taking a zoomed in picture. Maybe this is like, you know, uh, I'm not even going to kind of, let's say this is a millimeter length size. So I know I'm going to have some types of grains in my material. And so what I'm looking at in the borrow herring uh, creep, I'm looking at the bulk. So what's happening inside of all these grains? I'm not, I don't really care about what's happening along these grain boundaries here. We'll get to kind of the fusion and grain boundary. Because uh, again, creep is just a diffuse, you know, it's assisted by this kind of diffusive mechanism of basically vacancies or dislocations uh, uh, basically either long boundaries or diffusion of vacancies to dislocations as well. So we're trying to look at kind of these diffusive mechanisms and when they dominate. So for the bulk diffusion, we're looking at diffusion inside of these grains, in the bulk of your material, not along grain boundaries, not along uh, essentially dislocations. So for Navarro herring creep, we see that we have our constant. What is our x value here? Our sigma scales to the one power. So x equals one. What is my y value? Well, y, looking up from that equation uh, up there, is equal to minus 2 because dg, you could just rewrite this as dg to minus 2 power. And what is our c? 
our kind of mechanism here. It's Navarro herring creep. And again, it is the lattice or bulk or volume diffusion. So QL is basically the activation energy division for basically you know, lattice slash volume diffusion. How is QL, so the lattice uh, activation energy, going to compare with, for example, the activation energy for a grain boundary? Is it easier to move through a perfect lattice or is it easier to move through, uh, is it going to be harder to move through a lattice or is it going to be harder to move uh, via grain boundary? Well, we talked about this before, right? The diffusion is going to be larger uh, for grain boundary diffusion than for lattice diffusion, right? Because along that grain boundary here, there's basically more open space. There's more places to jump. So the activation energy Q GB is going to be less than QL, right? It's going to take less energy for us to jump and move along green boundary than to move, move along uh, basically your volumetric uh, or your kind of perfect lattice there. So we'll come back to that in a second when we kind of summarize these different mechanisms. Because we want to basically see, we're going to list uh, several different mechanisms and we're going to see when does this mechanism dominate? At what temperatures and at what values of stresses? Uh, and at what material properties like grain size? When are we going to dominate here? Move on to, excuse me, picking up my, pick it up. <laughs> let's go to the next page here. Um, so let's look at our next mechanism. So our next mechanism is going to be grain boundary diffusion. That's why I kind of brought it up just right now, or cobalt creep. So we're going to um, denote this as CC. So here, number of diffusive pathways increases as the grain size decreases. Activation energy for grain boundary diffusion is lower than the bulk. Just what we kind of talked about here. So um, also, exactly, this is a, a really kind of important mechanism here. So as your grain size, so looking at kind of that, if I have, this is a pretty large grain size material. And if I look at my cobalt creep, if I shrink my grain size, now I have, because this is all about diffusion along grain boundaries. As my G, DG decreases, as my grain size gets smaller and smaller and smaller, basically the number uh, basically, grain boundary diffusion paths, number of GB paths, increases as DG decreases. And we're going to see this in this equation right here. So what is my X? That's equal to 1 again. We see the stress scales as uh, similar to the 1 power. What is my Y? Minus 3, DG to the minus 3 power. And what is my C? My mechanism here is global creep, so CC, uh, grain boundary diffusion. But my Q is going to be this, again, GB. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, you know, if we're trying to see, you know, the whole goal of this is to see when does this mechanism, like at certain temperatures and a certain, you know, uh, basically stress values, which mechanism is going to dominate? So if we just think about temperature, shouldn't this diffusion coefficient, you know, with this exponential minus G QGB, Shouldn't this always dominate? Because QGB, assuming everything else is constant, is less than QL. Yes, I mean, it should dominate. But again, it depends on the number of diffusive pathways here. So again, as we increase our grain size, the number of this pathways decreases. And again, we're comparing this versus the bulk, right? So there's a lot more, you know, the number, the, the amount of grains uh, or grain boundaries that you could diffuse to in your material is going to be really, really, really small compared to your bulk. So again, it depends on the temperature. It depends on a lot of different parameters. And we're going to kind of see when each of these uh, diffuse, these mechanisms dominate in just a second. So let's get to, uh, before we, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but before we finish up, or we, uh, actually not before we finish up, but before we get to kind of looking at deformation mechanisms maps, let's look at our last uh, mechanism, which is dislocation creep or power lock creep. So this is important. So this is the net motion of dislocation cores and it typically will move in the direction of applied stresses. So we're going to see here the dependence of applied stress is critical, and look at the scaling behavior here. So power law creep, DLC or PLC, so you'll kind of see it abbreviated like that, power law creep, uh, or diffusion or dislocation creep, DC, um, diffusion law, power law creep, again, whichever parameter you want to kind of, uh, so don't really uh, care, Just typo here, I need to make sure to fix that. That is not Navarro herring, that is DLC. So what is our X? Well, our X here, stress will scale typically four to six. Our X is four to six. 
This is a huge difference, right? This is a gigantic jump in the scaling with stress. And that's why we're in this power law creep mechanism, we're going to see it is going to apply at very, very high values of stress because we have this huge scaling. It's going to dominate everything else here. So DLC or power law creep uh, is going to dominate when stress is really, really high. Um, so we'll see that in a second. What about our DG? Or excuse me, uh, what about our Y? What is our scaling with DG? It's not even here. So here our Y is zero. What about our Q or our C? Well, that is power law creep, DLC. And we see again here, Q is the lattice. So again, this is bull kind of behavior as well. Um, this is a nice kind of table to have on hand just to remind you of the different mechanisms. And we'll see um, where each of these mechanisms starts to dominate uh, in just a bit. So uh, let's look at a typical deformation mechanism map and try to put this all into context. So let's switch over here. Now, this is your typical deformation mechanism map. And I'm going to redraw that uh, graph in just a second. Uh, actually, that table. Um, because we are going to want to keep that here. And I'm going to do my... So this is your typical... Screen is this. Some constant KC times sigma x times dg to the y times uh, d naught exponential minus QC divided by uh, QC. So we know that we have our kind of table here for the different mechanisms. So we're going to do mech. So this is Navarro herring creep, um, power law creep. Again, you can read this much nicer in the notes. Uh, as usual, you know my handwriting. So that's why I use LaTeX. Always use LaTeX. Why? So for Navarro herring, we are just QL. Ah, right there. So QL. Here we are Q grain boundary, and here we are QL again. X uh, for here, 1, 1, 4, 6, EG, minus 2, minus 3, 0. So these are the different mechanisms we have at play. So let's look at this map. So we are plotting T versus TM. So at this value, RT equal to our melting temperature. This is um, kind of like the, hum uh, you'll see this kind of referred to as the homologous temperature. but it's just T over TM. So here, T equals TM. Here, we're at 0K. Now, this Y-axis, you'll see that is the stress normalized by our shear modulus G. So if you remember back all the way to the beginning of yielding, we said that our sigma Y theoretical, we could approximate as approximately G over 10. Uh, I think in the notes, it was actually G over 30 for a copper crystal. But again, this is a kind of nice parameter to have on hand. So when our stress... Uh, this dashed line is always going to be kind of at this value. So here, this dashed line denotes above here, we are going to yield basically the theoretical shear stress yielding. So that is how the material will yield in this section here. And this will always be constant. This material, or that is always kind of a constant value. This is just our theoretical line. So above that line, we are going to yield um, via kind of this theoretical yield, yield uh, shear limit. So this theoretical like shear stress limit. Or, or yield limit. So that, that, that dashed line is always going to occur at that 10 to the minus 1. Always, always be constant. Now, here, this, this solid line here is denoting the region between here and here, the theoretical yield, uh, yield stress or yield shear you know, limit line. This will be your dislocation glide. So this is the typical mechanism where, again, this is just motion of dislocations or yielding. Dislocation motion. So this is typically, you know, again, your usual me mechanism of how material yields. So our, our, you know, our strain here is not even creep. It's just this dislocation motion. So it's your edge dislocations running around your material, uh, driven just by kind of your shear, you know, your mechanical stress that's being applied in your material. Now, you can see that for a given temperature, this line will tell you uh, for any temperature, what is the stress? So this line is really just at a given temperature, what is your yield stress? So this will change depending on the size, obviously, um, what is the grain size of your material? So, you know, you'll see in a second that our deformation mechanism, and you'll see in the problem set as well, the deformation mechanism maps are going to shift. So some regions are going to grow and shrink depending on what we do to kind of our material. So if we change our grain size, 
your uh, theoretical, you know, or your your um, yield stress here, that value is going to shift and change. So uh, this line where you put it should uh, reflect that appropriately. So we'll get to that in just a second here. So dislocation glide, uh, check that one off. So in here below, so we're at low temperatures, at low you know stresses. So again, as we're going down here, we're decreasing our stresses. So below this, you know, this is again, this is the line that kind of denotes our sigma y. So below that stress, we're just elastic forming our material. Now, so this region is boring. We've covered that. We all know the equations. We all know the you know second rank tensors, fourth rank tensors to get that mathematically done. This region here, these regions, this is where things get interesting, right? Because we're below our yield stress limit, but still we're getting some strain and some deformation mechanism that's due to this creep. That's why creep mechanisms at high temperatures, uh, you can see here we're increasing in temperature. At high temperatures, that's why it's such an insidious mechanism, right? Because we shouldn't expect any kind of you know strange deformation mechanisms or strange yielding behavior to occur here, but we actually do see that happen. So what do we do? Or why, uh, you know, let's look at kind of and, and analyze why this regions, why these regions kind of form the way they do. So let's look first at why does DLC occur here? So DLC or, you know, power law creep, you know, DLC as well. Power law creep, DLC. So we see here, it's these parameters. Let's look at what's happening here. So where does this occur? Why is this, why is DLC on top of cobalt creep and uh, NH in terms of, um, basically, stress values. Well, it's because this parameter right here, right? This scaling, the way that this be, this mechanism, this E dot, the strain rate as a function of time scales with stress, is to the four to the sixth power. That is going to be an incredibly powerful, you know, uh, parameter that's going to, sh you know, or scaling behavior that's going to make this mechanism dominate at high values, high y-axis values of stress. So DLC will always be the kind of topmost mechanism on your y-axis. It has to dominate at large values of stresses because of this scaling parameter here. Nice. Now, uh, it also, you can see, it really doesn't kind of depend on, uh, on grain size as well. What about QL? Where will this dominate as well? Well, QL, we said QGB is less than QL. So we, uh, this activation energy to kind of move these dislocations, you know, we're going to have high values of stresses. We're also going to need to have high values of temperature. So that's why it kind of, again, dominates on this right side here. Now, let's focus on the difference between this one and this one. Specifically, why does this coal creep always occurs to the left on the x-axis of Nabarro heron So why is that? Well, let's look at the x-axis is controlled by temperature. Stress you see these values of the stream, so that's a wash. So it doesn't matter at all. You know, the stress scaling is essentially similar. Grain size, there's a difference, and we're going to look at that in just a second. But for temperature, really, the only where regime dominates in terms of temperature, that's just going to be determined solely by this parameter here, QL, QGB. So Cobalt Creek dominates at lower temperatures. Why is that? Well, it's exactly because of this relationship that we've talked about before. So the activation energy is less for the cobalt creep mechanism. So therefore, we don't need high, we don't need uh, high temperatures for that diffusion, this E sub C, so this um, uh, basically strain rate, this D naught here, our diffusion is gonna be higher always in cobalt creep versus Navarro herring for any given temperature. That's kind of the key parameter uh, that we're gonna kind of see here. But uh, you'll see, uh, you know, eventually at high enough temperatures, what's gonna happen is, and actually depending on the uh, amount of the grain size as well. Uh, the at certain temperatures, you're going to get a large enough contribution because again, let's break down into cobalt creep is all about diffusion along these pathways. So initially, at low temperatures, that activation energy is so low that just diffusion along these pathways is going to dominate diffusion along in the bulk, but as temperature increases and increases and increases, the, con the total contribution from all these regions is going to dominate uh, these kind of blue lines, right? Diffusion along the grain boundaries. So that's what's really happening here. So at high enough temperatures, the green is going to overtake the blue. Additionally, and we'll see this in a second, uh, 
It also depends on, the contribution will change depending on how large a grain size is. So that's a pretty large grain size area, or grain size, you know, just to begin with. As I shrink my grain size, and we could see this in the scaling here, this mechanism is going to dominate even more so because, look at, I have all of these different pathways that I can move along. So as my grain size decreases, I have more grain boundaries to diffuse around. So that's going to grow this region even further. We're going to see that in just a second. Um, so depending on the grain size, this will either, if I shrink my grain size, this region will grow. If I shrink my grain size, this region can shrink or even disappear all entirely. So let's look at a, kind of an example of these maps. So this is an example of a typical deformation mechanism map. So you can see different materials here. I'm going to kind of shade this out um, because I want to kind of give you a little example. So let's think and let's look at, actually I'm going to look at all of these. So you can still see, we always see our, dis, our theoretical shear stress C. It's always typically around that 10 to the minus 1. So that does not shift. It does not change. Um, ignoring these materials. Uh, so let's call this A, B, C, and D here. So looking at, let's start at a temperature of 0. Which material is going to have the largest yield stress? So again, the yield stress is just this line right here, right? This point crosses out. So here, it's, for this material, for C, it's even, you know, we're basically at the theoretical shear stress at zero uh, Kelvin. Same thing here. So it's kind of approaching here. So that slope's a little bit larger. So I would say that my yield stress of C is greater than my yield stress of D. And I kind of, <laughs> let me erase my little mark. So I could kind of see. And that is greater than my yield stress. Um, I'd say that D, uh, B is a little bit larger uh, than A, but just by hair. Because again, you see it kind of ticks up there in the last second. Here, it's just always at 10 to the minus 2. So I can look at that just, I can deduce that material or that uh, behavior just by looking at these maps. But let's look a little bit deeper. So between A and B, what could possibly be giving these different uh, values here? So let's look at Cobalt Creep. Look at that region. It's huge, right? But here in B, let's assume that these are all the same material. Now we've shrunk, even though we know it's not, um, that region, that cobalt creep region is shrunk. What could be happening here? What controls how large that region is? Well, again, it depends on the number of diffusive pathways, which depends on the number of uh, basically grains. So if I have large grain sizes, I don't have as many grain boundary diffusive pathway, pathways. Additionally, if we look back to the page that we were on just a second ago, we know that this mechanism for cobalt creep scales as dg to the minus third. So if I increase my grain size, I'm shrinking this contribution. So that's what's happening here. Here, the difference, if I look at grain size, dg of a versus dg of b, dg here, grain size of b, my grain size of b is much larger than my grain size of a. And we could just tell that based on the size of this contribution here. And again, you still see it always, cobalt is always to the left, dislocation creep highest because it scales again uh, with that four to six parameter. And Navarro herring creep has to be on the right. Why? Because only at high enough temperatures does that volume, the bulk, overcome these grain boundary diffusive pathways. So you can even kind of continue this mechanism here. Uh, so you can see in C, there's even no cobalt region at all. So it's, you know, you could even, <laughs> you could probably guess that, you know, uh, dg of c is much greater than dg of b. So yeah, that's about it. So that's how you read these mechanism maps. So be prepared on an exam and on problem sets. You'll have to kind of label these maps. Uh, and again, if there's, you know, if there's no region there, it's just no R herring, uh, you know, creep only. There could be no cobalt creep because again, it could be a huge grain size. Uh, and there's lots of kind of other values that uh, kind of dominate here. So you can see these maps uh, they'll shift and change again depending on your material, depending on how you process. But you just want to kind of break it down and see why is you know why is this changing? What could be possibly leading to it? And again, put it in the context of grain size, QL, QGB, and stress. And we know that these values they are determined by temperature, stress, our x-axis, x-axis. This is kind of our y-axis here. And DG, it can shift, again, depending on, you know, the size of those regimes. So if you do that, you'll be good to go. So uh, let me know if you have any questions on this. And 
yeah, I'll see you in the next video when we finally get to Fracture. Have a good one. Bye.